I'm Mike Ehrman, Chairman of the Historical Society. This is, as I sometimes remind people, that our 10th, maybe 11th year in which we've been having these talks. And uh, one of the things that we're starting to do is come back around on a few of them. Uh, the topic tonight with another speaker we had five or six years ago. And we do that from time to time. Our speaker tonight is uh, Jackie Broslowski. And Jackie is the Director of Informal Education of Temple Sinai. She's been with the, the temple now five years, she tells me. Came here from Arizona and from various places around the country. And Jackie's going to talk about the process by which people arrived at Temple Sinai and also about the beautiful building where Temple Sinai is located. Welcome. Thank you. If you want to use this. No, I don't think so. Okay. I'm pretty loud. It's my nature. If you if you, she needs to mm. tell her to <laughs> turn it on. A lot of old ears in this old room. <laughs> I'll talk loud. Um, my name is Jackie Breslowski. Um, I started my journey in Jewish education ten years ago when my husband and I moved here from Arizona to um, work at the Hillel Jewish University Center on campus. And I was hired as a director of some engagement or Jewish student life, and I had an opportunity to work and build the organization and uh, work with the student leadership. After four years of being at Hillel, I stayed at home with my, when my son was born for a year, and then I worked at Road of Shalom for a year as a membership director. After a year at Road of Shalom, I was offered an opportunity to work at Temple Sinai, basically in my dream job, which is Director of Informal Jewish Education. A lot of people ask me, well, what's informal Jewish education? Um, basically, informal Jewish education is experiential education. My job is to build relationships and create experiences for our congregants. I focus on creating circles of intimacy for people to connect in and have it, give them an opportunity to, um, to meet them where they are in their um, spiritual development and in their Judaism. So I feel very, very, very blessed and very lucky that I get to do something that I love so much. Um, currently, I'm finishing a master's degree in Jewish professional studies. And when Flo Chapman asked me to give this talk, it's because I am taking a class with Barbara Burston, who I'm sure many of you know. And um, the class was basically um, the history of we, our assignment was to focus on something that we wanted to learn more about, the history about. And Temple Sinai, it always fascinated me because everyone kept telling me, well, Temple Sinai was formed from Road of Shalom. And since I worked at Road of Shalom and I worked at Temple Sinai, I was so curious to know how Temple Sinai came about. Since it's so close to Road of Shalom, and I, did, I had no idea which... Um, which way, um, I, I just didn't have any idea of which way or how things worked. So I started on this ridiculously long journey of research uh, that I've been working on for the past year of how Temple Sinai was created. And also I'm very lucky because my office happens to be in one of the greatest rooms in the Worthington Mansion that ever, so that whole building just, it's, so beautiful and every day that I get to go in and sit in my office I'm always wondering who was here before me and if these walls could talk so the Worthington Mansion is in it of itself a beautiful place to be so we're going to focus on the formation of Temple Sinai as we know Temple Sinai started from Road of Shalom and we could not possibly begin to talk about Temple Sinai without focusing on the, um, the Pittsburgh platform of Reform Judaism that was um, brought to Road of Shalom in um, the late 1800s. So, Road of Shalom had gotten to a point where they had reached their capacity, and their charters, their chartered, they were chartered for 1,400 members, and they had increased it from 1,200 members. And in, at the end of 1944, they had their membership committee meeting. Their synagogue was, their leadership was Solomon Freehoff, the wonderful orator and rabbi 
who led their congregation. And in 1940, at the end of, sorry, in 1945, there was a membership committee meeting that was run by F.T. Weil. At that meeting, he reported that earlier in 1944, they were at 1,303 members, but they could only have 1,400 members according to their charter, and they had a stack of applications. So literally, they felt like they were bursting at the seams, and they didn't know what to do. So it was really, um, there was a lot of stress around all of that, and what they needed to do was create a special committee to really investigate and look at these issues in a way that would be safe within the congregation, that it wasn't a negative thing. So when that was brought to the congregation, and when the special committee was appointed, um, their, their main task was to conduct a, a extensive investigation on the number of unaffiliated Jews in the Pittsburgh area to see who we weren't meeting and what they were, what Road of Shalom could expect. Well, obviously, that scared a lot of the members of Road of Shalom. And the temple became, went into this divide. Half of them did not want to create a new temple, but the other half knew that they had to meet the needs of these unaffiliated Jews. So a national committee was appointed to investigate the issue of the unaffiliated Jewish families in the Pittsburgh com community based on this organization that, uh, or on this special committee that was headed by Dr. David Glick. And at this meeting, at the, special, at the membership committee meeting, Dr. Freehoff wanted to put on the table that even though there might be a divide within the congregation, now was the time. It was time to explore building a second reformed temple in Pittsburgh. And this is not the first time that I found in the research that Dr. Freehoff had said this, although it is the only person who I did see had said this. Um, he said attendance to temple was very important, and he basically was saying that your temple is only going to be as important as the people who come to your worship. So he was really advocating on people coming to worship, even though they're seams were bursting. And I think what he was doing, from just from what all the research I've read and was looking at, I think he was trying to encourage people to come and worship so they could see that there was a need for a second reformed congregation. Because, well, you'll, I'll tell you in a few minutes about how many unaffiliated Jews there were in the Pittsburgh area that really needed to be connected. So we move on now to January of 1946. The National Committee met in New York from um, the special committee that was created at Road of Shalom, hooked in with that National Committee. They all went to the 39th Annual Biennial, and that was in um, New York City. And at the time, it was the Union for Hebrew Congregations. Well, the UAHC decided to invest $100,000 in exploring the problem of the unaffiliated across the country. So the money was to pay the expenses of the survey. This is, um, within all the work that I did and all the research that I saw, this is the first evidence that I found with recorded information mentioning the exploration of um, a new synagogue. There was never any speak about it. Um, like I said before, Dr. Freehoff had mentioned, well, we're growing, we're growing, we're growing, but there wasn't anything else in any newspapers or anything. It was really interesting for me. So in connection with that resolution to investigate the amount of unaffiliated Jews in Pittsburgh, some of the Road of Shalom members were becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the possible results and the implications of those results. So at their annual, um, at their annual meeting, oh, oh, sorry. At their annual meeting at Road of Shalom, in March, Mr. Strasburg, who was the president at the Strasburg, who was the president at the time, um, said, changes need to be made for the greater good of the Jewish people. We can't continue where we're going. We can't connect with our congregants. They're, we're way too big. There's no personal um, connection the rabbis have, or the rabbi has with our congregants. We have a choice. We can 
really increase our membership to 1,500, but we have to focus on the size of our congregation. So the other major issue was they had, I think the number I saw was 910 kids in their religious school. They could not, they could not house 910 kids in their religious school. There were so many people for high holidays that they did not fit in soldiers and sailors where they were having their services. So it was, I mean, something really needed to be done to um, accommodate the needs of these unaffiliated Jews who only came to high holidays or who sent their kids to religious school to get a Jewish education. So Dr. Eisendrath from the Union um, was scheduled to come to Pittsburgh to assess the needs of the unaffiliated Jews. Um, and it was two options. Do we continue to grow or do we support a new congregation? So at the annual meeting, Dr. Freehoff was called upon to give the congregation the final words. And he made a point of telling the congregation that the idea of exploring the possibilities of a new congregation of Pittsburgh was his idea. He emphasized the importance that a rabbinic influence had on its congregants and how this only was conveyed through attendance of public worship. Um, he also stated that a rabbi's success is only measured by attendance, which I thought was also kind of funny and interesting. So. Um, uh, this research came directly from the archives at Rosh Shalom and um, in, their, in their notes. I spent hours in there with Martha. If you ever have anything you want to research, go see Martha at Rosh Shalom because she is phenomenal. Um, so let's see. So the next meeting took place on April 28, 1946 at the Concordia Club, and this was basically um, Rhoda Shalom's Board of Trustees and two reps from the National Committee. Uh, the first one was Rabbi Maurice Eisendrath, and the second rep was Max Strayer from Polony and Chicago. Um, Dr. Eisendrath came, and there he is, <laughs> he came to report what the findings were. And those findings were that not more than 25% of the of Jews in the metropolitan city are affiliated and not more than 10% are affiliated with the Reformed Temple. That leaves a lot of Jews with nowhere to go. So he believed that we were at a crossroads. We can either sit back and do nothing or work for the unaffiliated. So the results of the National Committee study has the biggest impact in bigger cities. And he also reported that many of these cities and congregations have sprung up as a result of disputes or um, congregations separating. We really wanted to avoid that in Pittsburgh because it wasn't happening as a result of a dispute. It was happening as a result of a need. So Mr. Strayer pointed out that in all the large cities, reformed temples were filled to capacity. This is not an anomaly in Pittsburgh. This is not something that was only happening here. It was happening all across the country. Um, in his opinion, Pittsburgh was the most important city in the United States in the development of the reform movement because the Pittsburgh platform is what started the reform movement. Uh, if Pittsburgh would encourage the formation of a new synagogue, then people would start to model what they're doing, what we were doing here in other cities. The only other city that had the same thing happening was Cleveland. Cleveland had already, at this point, had two reform synagogues, and the two reform synagogues were working together to create a third reform synagogue. Um, he also stated that the National Committee would send a rep to Pittsburgh to study the endeavor and organize a new reform congregation only if it had the blessing of Rhoda Shalom. If we didn't have the blessing of Rhoda Shalom, then we weren't going to do it. Um, and Dr. Freehoff was there, and he said, you know, I, like I said before, he pointed out that he had he felt confident that his board would not impede in this process because this is something that he's been grooming his board for for many years. Um, there was a slight issue with one of the board members. His name was Lesser Aaron, and he did bring up the idea of uh, small congregations were a thing of the past, and big congregations were the trend, and that's the way they should be going. <coughs> And going into a smaller congregation was a bad idea. Um, that was quickly, quickly objected, and uh, Leon Falk Jr. 
who was involved on both sides, said the very point of creating the congregation will solve the problems of being a part of a temple that is too big. People don't want to be lost in the crowd. People want to know that they matter. Which is interesting how history repeats itself because we are now, in 2013, going back to that place of matterness where Judaism is more about relationships and it's not so much about being a part of a 1,500-member congregation. So we'll talk more about that later. So the results, I know you can't see the slide. I can't really see this slide either. Um, the results of uh, Mr. Strayer was, um, I basically just told you all the results, but Dr. Freehoff pointed out that um, we could only do it with the blessing of Rhoda Shalom and that his board would not stand in the way. And the meeting ended with the board making a promise of a decision at their next meeting. So now they're under the, now they're under the gun. Like, this is it. You have to make a decision. What do you want to do? So their next meeting was only a month later, and it was in May. Time to make a decision. A final special meeting would now be called with the congregation to discuss the matter, and Mr. Falk made this motion. The board recommends to the congregation that it is approved in principle the union's project for starting a new reform congregation in Pittsburgh, and that Rhoda Shalom cooperate in this undertaking. And so they did. <coughs> um, it was also said at that very meeting that, um, well, actually, be, at that meeting, Rhoda Shalom had received a letter from Mr. Strayer advising them that the two large reform congregations um, in Cleveland that I spoke about before were becoming more and more successful to hopefully ease the anxiety that anyone might, may have had about developing this third congregation. Um, So they created a special time to bring the entire congregation together to tell them about um, this formation of the new synagogue. And that took place in January, or in June, I'm sorry. It was on the morning of June 23rd that all the members of the congregation were called together and the president, E.B. Strasburg, presided. The president stated that the meeting was being held to consider and take action upon the following resolution passed by the Board of Trustees. And basically the re resolution is saying that Rhoda Shalom is giving us our blessing to undertake this endeavor and for a <coughs> new synagogue which shall be called Temple Sinai um, to be created. So there were a couple things that were interesting around it though. One of the things that I found to be really interesting is Rhoda Shalom did not want this to come from Rhoda Shalom. Rhoda Shalom encouraged the UAHC, which is now the Union for Reform Judaism, to, um, to take this endeavor upon themselves. So there was no misunderstandings in the community. Uh, they wanted it to be seen as a, um, a, a project that is done from the union with their blessing so, so, that, so their members didn't feel like they were being divided. Um, and, and it, some people liked that idea, some people didn't like that <coughs> idea. But Rhoda Shalom also loaned Temple Sinai $7,500 the first year they were um, born to help find a building, fund a rabbi, hire a secretary, and a soloist. So it was it was very amicable, and it was it was it was a good relationship. So. Jackie, question. Was it a foregone conclusion that the second temple would be in Squirrel Hill? We, the, they hadn't figured out the site exactly, but because of the population study that they did, they did recognize that in this area, there were the most concentrated um, reformed Jews. So, and I think it's because, I know my family um, immigrated to McKeesport, and I know that they're, Polish Hill was very, very, very much Jewish. But I think a lot of those pocket neighborhoods were Orthodox pockets. And um, I think because of Rhoda Shalom being just a mile down the road, 
that this area was there was a lot of reformed Jews uh -huh. who were already going there. Right. Would they be forced to come to Temple Sun? Did they feel like they might have to come to Temple Sun? So that was something that I had read about as well. And what um, what they said is, you there could be dual membership in the synagogues. And if Temple Sinai didn't work out, could the members of Road of Shalom, what would they do who came to Temple Sinai? And it said, um, in one of the notes that I read, it said that they would just absorb the members back into Road of Shalom. So, no, there was no, um, well, we'll talk, well, you'll see in this part of the presentation about um, how Temple Sinai started. So it, the first meeting for Temple Sinai was in 1946 above Sun Drugs, which is the corner of, it's, this is actually um, um, Cold Stone Creamery right now. So, and hot yoga, which is so funny that yoga and ice cream. Um, anyway, so, but next to it you see the squirrel cage, and next to that is a squirrel hill newsstand, which is still there. Um, so the first meeting took place in the office of Lewis Kaplan with Rabbi Burton Levinson, who was sent here from the union. The union asked him to come here with his wife to, um, to start this new synagogue. And there was Lewis Kaplan, Burton Lewis, there's a whole list of people, but I don't have them on my notes right now. So. How big is the main Temple Sinai? Yeah, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay. So we were under the leadership of Burton Levinson, and Leon Falk Jr. was, he was instrumental in both <coughs> congregations. And what's interesting is at Temple Sinai, there's a folk library, and at, um, at Road of Shalom, there's a folk library. So he was, he was a... A good guy. So, from this first meeting, upon his arrival, the first thing Rabbi Levinson did was book the um, young men and women's young. Uh, it's Hebrew Association. Young men and young women's. women Hebrew Association, which my father played basketball. Apparently, he told me <laughs> the other night that he used to play, take the bus in from McKeesport and play basketball there. So he had booked that for high holiday services and also secured a few churches in Squirrel Hill for services for, through the National Conference of Christians, who he was very connected with. Um, Rabbi Levinson understood the importance uh, of congregants feeling ownership towards their temple. He had that mindset of relational Judaism. Um, he strongly requested that the affiliated reach the unaffiliated for the organization of Temple Sinai to not just take this endeavor upon themselves. Um, during the meeting in Mr. Kaplan's office, Rabbi Levinson shared that the UAHC will contribute $5,000 towards our first year's budget. And he also made it clear that all eyes were on Pittsburgh, since it is the first time an established Jewish congregation had given its blessing to help a new congregation. Mm -hmm. um, it was at this point in the meeting that Mr. Strasberger, who was the president of Road of Shalom, who played a really instrumental role in uh, the formation of Temple Sinai, he gave a comprehensive report on the effects of the overcrowding in the religious school and how, how Rhoda Shalom had, had a um, policy that they would never close its doors to anybody. And Rhoda Shalom and Temple Sinai still hold true to these values of everyone is welcome. They will never close their doors on anyone. But the reason why we really needed a second synagogue is to maintain those values of never closing its doors on someone. And uh, because they were up to 1,500 people, it was time. And he wanted to inform the group about, um, at this meeting, he wanted to inform the group about their issues and how he was there to help them make things happen. Um, it, this is interesting. It was Louis Reisenstein, as in Reisenstein School, who suggested moving forward with the creation of the new Reform Synagogue. And if by some chance it wasn't successful, then Road of Shalom could absorb the members at a later date. The entire team of lay members knew the importance of, of, of this endeavor, and they were very focused on finding people who would be willing to work. That was written in the minutes several times. We need to find a team that would be willing to work. <laughs> so that was clearly important when you're trying to start a new synagogue or any new organization. Before the close of the meeting, I, 
at the sun drugs, above the sun drugs, uh, an important point was put on the table that um, Rosh Shalom should, Rosh Shalom wanted to make it clear to the um, founding members of Temple Sinai that they didn't feel like they wanted to be forefront in the formation process of Temple Sinai. They wanted to kind of sit back and be in the background of, of watching it all happen. So that was that was put out there. The a committee was created, as we do, uh, and it consisted of Lewis Kaplan, John Cohen, Leon Falk Jr., Lewis Friedman, David Glick, Harry Rice, Reisenstein, Rogaliner, and Burton, Rabbi Burton Levinson. So their next meeting took place. <coughs> At the Hundred Club and the William Penn Hotel, and it was a informal meeting, but it was to set policy of Temple Sinai, and it was to set policy uh, and do dues membership dues structure, and also to hire Miss Jean Rothschild for to be Rabbi Levinson's secretary, and <coughs> Mr. Leonard Freed, who was hired to be the male soloist of the new congregation. So for a senior family member, it was $40 a year. A junior family member, ages 21 to 33, it was $20 a year. And a single membership was $12 a year. A little bit different now, probably. <laughs> I, thought, I always like seeing that, so. What, the, what came out of this <coughs> informal meeting in the 100 Club was a date and policies set for September 8th, 1946, to have a meeting of people in the community to come together to help form Temple Sinai. Jackie, tell us now, where did the name come from? I, I will in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Temple Sinai could not officially be Temple Sinai until it was voted to be Temple Sinai. And I'll, I'm going to go into that in just a second. So um, instead of, going back to what I was saying, instead of having all of the people who are already involved organize Temple Sinai, they really wanted people who were interested in creating this new synagogue to become involved and to be an active part of it. So they put an ad in the paper and said, now is your time to come and be a part of this reform congregation. Our first meeting to create this organization will be September 8th at the Hotel Shenley. And please come if you're interested in being a part of it. So about 300 people showed up at the official organization meeting on September 8th, 1946. <clears throat> and as you can see the um, the speech is very 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 long so i'm not going to go through the speech but i will tell you where the name came from so the meeting started out at 8 15 in the evening and the president was benjamin lynch lyncher he um judge lyncher yes he um, issued the following statement. He said, although there are several houses of worship in Pittsburgh for the Jewish faith, a minimum of 3,000 people are affiliated with no synagogue. Great interest has been voiced in Friday evening services, particularly by the younger married groups. The organization of Temple Sinai has grown out of a need. It was not born out of discord, but one out of dire need for a more personalized reform Judaism. Pittsburgh's second reform temple has the blessing of Rodolf Shalom congregation. That was followed up by Dr. Da or Mr. David Gluck making, um, he seconded that motion, and he said in his motion, We of ancient face of Judaism have always felt and believed that wherever religion builds its altars, there's flames of burning bush. And he who would draw nigh to it must be mindful of the ancient command. Take off thy shoes for the ground upon which thou standest is holy. We are about to embark on a sacred task, the building of a new altar, a new synagogue dedicated to the advancement of, of Reformed Judaism, prophetic Judaism, and we undertake that task in a mood of joy. Judaism has always es eschewed the practice of proselytizing, and historically Judaism has never supported evan 
evangelical work. Yet, we are an eternal people bound to, with a sacred book and a religion that we firmly believe is everlasting. So he continues on that path until he comes to the bottom of his speech where he says, In gratitude to our God and the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he who has watched over us since the days of ancient Egypt, when our forefathers were strangers in the land, and in the memory of our great prophets of ancient days, and in tribute to the millions of our brethren who throughout centuries were martyred because of their faith, I move, Mr. Chairman, and if seconded and if improved, approved, to announce the beginning of a new congregation in Pittsburgh to be known as Sinai. Whence came the Ten Commandments, those moral laws through and by which mankind must live to survive. Those laws given to the world by Moses, which represents moral force, moral force which is irresistible and unconquerable. That's where the name Temple Sinai came from. But who came up with it? Temple I mean, Sinai? It, it was decided before they started it. I think probably Rabbi Levinson. Oh. Yeah. So, but it, it was meant to represent the um, the mood of joy, the um, the moral force for which is irresistible and is a is a Rock in Judaism, like it's a, it's a it's a hold fast. Mm -hmm. So that's was the metaphor for Temple Sinai being Temple Sinai. So the, mes the that motion was seconded by Lewis Friedman, and we have Temple Sinai. So Rabbi uh, at that uh, meeting, Rabbi Levinson, what I discovered is in. The, as I was looking through the onion skin notes of the original <clears throat> meetings that took place was, I didn't see any, if anyone had ever really written out any of the speeches that Rabbi Levinson gave or any of the speeches that um, any of our founding members had given. So I took upon myself to spend some time in um, rewriting and, and transcribing all of those speeches. Um, I'm happy to send them out to anyone who's interested. I'm not going to do that for you with all of this here. But it was, it, it was very inspiring for me as a Jewish communal service worker and someone who has dedicated my entire life to the continuity of Jewish people. To hear the words of Rabbi Levinson, who was the father, of, founding father of Temple Sinai, he was very inspiring. He was very um, um, a mensch. He was just a very nice. Sounded like a very nice man. He was very smart, so <clears throat> and very humble. So he set out five goals for Temple Sinai, and to this day, I think that we really focus on those five goals still which are organize Pittsburgh Second Reform Temple, create a sense of warmth, um, have a place for everyone to, be, to feel welcome, um, root a generation of children in the principles of their faith to take their places in their day with pride and dignity. Uh, temple Sinai would take its place in the larger scheme of the Jewish life of Pittsburgh. Now, it's 2013. And if you look at our mission and our vision statement at Temple Sinai, it reflects all five of those things. And I don't know if it's purposeful. I don't think that the strategic committee, strategic planning committee necessarily looked back in the onion skin paper and said, oh, we have to go with Rabbi, what Rabbi Levinson said. I think it's just the essence of who we are at Temple Sinai. So now the fun part, because now we get to talk about the Worthing Convention. <laughs> oh, before we talk about the Worthington Mansion, <laughs> um, Temple Sinai, while we were trying to find a place to house our congregants, we had relationships with the Asbury Methodist Church, so we had services there, and we also had services right here in this building, Church of the Redeemer. The library. It was right where it was the library. The library. See, look, it's <coughs> that building is the corner of Forbes and Murray where the library is. Yeah. I found some really great sites with old Pittsburgh pictures. Mm -hmm. 
So when we were searching for a home for Temple Sinai, we had several different options. The Maimonides house was one of those options, which that's the Anathan house, I believe it's called. Yeah. It's NCJW. So that was um, really, really hot on the table was the Maimonides house. That was their first pick. They put an offer in there. It um, didn't work out because it got all the way to the point where they were about to sign the papers and they weren't willing to sign the papers. So that fell through. Then, Who the was Maimonides house. Um, then it, the other option was a place on Owlsboro and um, Owlsboro Avenue. I can't remember the crossroads. And then there was another place right near Tree of Life. And they were worried. They actually went to speak to the rabbi at Tree of Life because they were worried if they opened up a synagogue very close to Tree of Life, if it would affect anything from Tree of Life. And he said, we're a conservative synagogue. I'm not planning on changing my platform. There's nothing that I'm going to do to change, you know, to become a reformed Jew. You are more than welcome to open up a synagogue right next to us, but we're still going to be conservative Jews. So that building fell through as well. Um, so then, you know, what was it like? Maimonides house. Was that the name of the family that owned the house? No. The Maimonides house was a learning, um, was a house that was created in the 20s, I believe, by an Orthodox Jew for Jewish learning. So it's, I would say it's similar to the Kolo. Now, so how did we get to the Worthington Mansion? It's a little confusing how we got to the Worthington Mansion because there's a couple of different rumors. There's some of the rumors are that Worthington was um, anti-Semitic. And the other rumors are <coughs> that um, we couldn't buy the Worthington Mansion and we had to go to court. And <coughs> it's interesting, when you start doing the research, how many rumors will people come up to me and ask me, did you hear about the huge court case with <laughs> The Worthington Mansion, and I was like, no, actually, there was no court case with the Worthington Mansion. The issue, <coughs> excuse me, as far as the Worthington Mansion goes, um, there was a group of members who stumbled upon the Worthington Mansion, and they knew it was for sale because it was empty. And it was empty for a really long time. And at the time, after four months, this is about four months after the establishment of Temple Sinai in January, there was about 125 members in Temple Sinai. They met to discuss how finding a permanent spot for Temple Sinai in Squirrel Hill. The mansion that was on Forbes and Murdoch was on the market for $135,000. And it, they knew that it would house 250 people. However, they also knew that they needed at least $65,000 to renovate the mansion. So knowing that the members would have to immediately raise that kind of money, they felt um, anxious about it, and they weren't sure about it. So <clears throat> even though they felt anxiety about it, they kept growing and growing. And the sisterhood had 65 members at this point. And brotherhood was about to, you know, come into play. And there was so much loyalty and devotion in, in this congregation and so much inspiration that they felt they could do anything, which I can completely understand. I mean, now we are <coughs> almost at 900 or around, hovering around there, and it's still the same way. Um, so I can imagine how committed those 125 or 145 families must have felt in finding a permanent house for Temple Sinai, and I can, I can just imagine. So at a board meeting in February, it was reported that the mansion could not be sold for at least six or seven months from when they were looking at. So they couldn't, this was in February, and they knew even if they put an offer in, they couldn't get the mansion until at least September 1st. So. Um, 
Mr. Lebov, who was reporting on the building search, added that he was under the impression that they, it could not be sold to Temple Sinai, but it would have to be purchased through an individual. The only reason this happened is because it was a C zone. C zone is a residential zone. It's not because Worthington was anti-Semitic. It's not because it was a synagogue. It's only because it was zoned as a C zone. And so what they decided to do was have an individual purchase it. So Mr. Birdman visited the attorney with regards to the mansion on behalf of Temple Sinai, and they were um, they were upset that the statement said it couldn't be sold to a religious group as a house of worship. So <clears throat> at that time, the, pop, the property was down to $100,000. And Mr. Birdman, he, he was feeling very empowered. He said, okay, I'm gonna just make an offer for 85 and see what happens. And even though they were already a pending bid in for $75,000, Mr. Birdman had already purchased a piece of property not next to Temple Sinai, but across the street from Temple Sinai. And um, he said, if the bid, because he decided they were going to do a personal bid. They said, if we can't do it as an organization, I'm going to do a personal bid. So if the bid for the mansion was accepted for the property, they knew it wouldn't be available until September 1st, and they knew it would cost $65,000 to convert the dining room into a chapel, and the rabbi knew that it stood the way it was. Without doing any of that, it was totally worthless to Temple Sinai. It was a home, you know? So the rest of the building search committee agreed that because so many synagogues started out as community houses, that if that bid came through, that they, it was unanimous that they would accept it and that would be the new home to Temple Sinai. As it turned out, May of 1947, after negotiations, a bid of $85,000 was accepted and the mansion was personally financed to a Mr. Philip Friedman. So, or was personally financed to, uh, I'm sorry, not Mr. Philip Friedman. It was personally financed to two different gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Philip Friedman was the architect who was invited to uh, do the preliminary sketches. So, have you, have, who here has been inside of Temple Sinai? Okay. Okay, good. So, on um, <clears throat> when they reported uh, at their May 27th meeting in 1947 that uh, how they got them came to buy Temple Sinai was Temple Sinai borrowed $3,000 in addition to the sale of purchase they borrowed $35,000 privately, which was authorized by the Board of Trustees. And um, through that $35,000, through a bank loan, they also borrowed $35,000 from Pittsburgh's People's, People's Pittsburgh Trust Company. And that's how they were able to ascertain Temple Sinai. And the final cost with taxes was $87,500. $87, and it came with the house next door, which Temple Sinai sits there, and the new sanctuary is here. There's a house right next to that that came with the Worthington Mansion that we still rent out today. So it's it was just part of the deal of the property. So the Worthington Mansion was designed and built by Lewis Stevens. He moved to Pittsburgh specifically to design the Worthington Mansion. But some, after he took on this um, responsibility of building and designing Temple Sinai, it really catapulted his career, and he became a fellow for the American Institute. He also designed the, the Jewish Home for the Aged here in Pittsburgh, and he actually um, stayed at the mansion while he was designing and building it. I do. I do. Um, well, I'll tell you a little bit about John Worthington to start with. He was um, he was a civil and mining engineer. He was in civil and mining engineer. He was a civil and mining engineer. 
and an oil operator. He was born in Mar on March 14, 1848 in South Wales. He was a Welshman. He came to the United States with his family in 1852. He became a superintendent of Mechman Farm Oil Company. In 1880, he had a mining business in Colorado, and he was the mayor of, I, I want to say that's Aurora, Colorado, yeah. which is right outside of Denver, but my sister lived there, and it was not spelled like that. So it might just be a small mining town in Colorado. Um, he came back to Pittsburgh in 1886, and he became the superintendent of the South Oil Company, and then he went to the Standard Oil Company in New Jersey. He married Mary Oak. Oh, he was a member of the Presbyterian Church and a director of the Union of National Bank of Pittsburgh. I know they entertained a lot. They were very, very social people. He married Mary Ellen McCleary on March 25, 1880, and he had one daughter, and um, her name was Mary Worthington, and uh, he died on a train in 1918. And here's his obituary. And it doesn't say how he died, <coughs> but they said it was sudden that he died. And apparently he was friends with Lloyd George, and Lloyd George had come to, after, after Worthington died, Lord George came to stay at the mansion in 1923. So Worthington didn't even have a chance to be an anti-Semite or had any idea that there was Jewish people going to be in his home because he died in 1918. Um, he, they often had parties in the garden at the Worthington mansion. Winston Churchill, as a child, came and stayed with the Worthingtons and they had built a special room for him there. And I believe, from the research I did, I believe that special room is the kindergarten suite now, where we house our kindergarten kids. So, he was very, very committed to his, um, his Welsh background. And, it, and it's all, you'll see, it's all over the home. Their motto as a family was um, the wings of the waves of us. And if you look in the fireplace that's located in the Lockhart Lounge, his, the crest is still in there. I, I just took these pictures this past week. And this slide is covering it up, but there's a J on that side and the W on this side. And this is their family crest, um, which is, it's an argent with three tridents and sable. And it's, it's everywhere in the mansion. And as you go through the mansion, you can see it. And it's just amazing. So there's stained glass windows in the mansion that have a lot of letters on them. And the letters are Welsh. And the three main things that these windows are saying, this one says the truth against the world is, is what it is interpreted as here. So this is the crest, the Worthington crest, which is the three tridents of the sables. Oh, sorry, it's hard to figure out the orientation here. Um, and these, yeah. You, you, you said Worthington died in 1918, didn't have a chance to be an anti-Semite. Right. Who owned the house after Worthington? His kids. His kids. And it was, uh, <coughs> it was just the, the estate. And it really, when Temple Sinai acquired it, it was not in the best of shape at all. So his daughter died in, I believe, 47. So these are the stained glass windows that are in the Lockhart Lounge that are still, uh, that are still there. And this one has, the meaning of it is in God's presence and in his peace. And you can see the crown and the feathers. That's, uh, on that window, there's some Welsh that says, in God's presence and in his peace. This is the red Welsh red dragon. And the, um, and he, the first is an inscription on the Welsh shield, which you can see, this is like, right here is the shield, and that's the flag, and this is the dragon, and the dragon 
The legend has it that the red dragon sleeps and he will wake when needed. This is all over. Like the dragon is all over different places at Temple Sun. <coughs> This particular window, which is located in the um, lock, uh, what's the area? Lockout lounge, Lockhart Lounge. I think it's just in that uh, in that entry hall. In the yeah, it's does that have a name? Entry hall. Yeah. Does it have a name? Do you know? So the entryway that's located right near the big <laughs> clock in the entry entryway going into the chapel, and in this window is where you see all of like the different like Welsh sayings. So it's it's really a neat place to be. This is our chapel. This was the Worthington dining room. This chapel was imported from England, from a Tudor castle in England, into Temple Sinai, or into the Worthington mansion. And um, a long I saw just one old, old, old picture that you couldn't even really make out of how their dining room was set up, and it was just this big, long table in the center, and the fireplace was working, and there's a dumb waiter that we still have at Temple, and it's um, this is what the ceiling, those are all imprinted on the ceiling of the chapel. And they're in really good shape, actually. I always wondered every time I was in there. And this is the entryway to go into the chapel, and it's all original. It's all original work, and that was part of the castle from, um, from England. This is above, this dragon here is, is above the door to go into the chapel. And it's um, molded out of sandstone into the entryway. And again, it's the Welsh Red Dragon. <coughs> the, the Falk Library. So that is, origin, that is was part of buying Temple Sinai was we couldn't do a lot of renovation to Temple Sinai. Um, that was just part of what the agreement was. The Falk Library was filled with the largest Americana collection in the United States. Worthington, um, actually let me. Jackie, do you need a light? Um, I think I'm okay. <laughs> Mr. Johnson and Miss Moreland donated the John Worthington Memorial Library in 1956 a valuable collection of 5,000 Americana books to the Carnegie Library. He also had the largest collection, Welsh collection of books in, um, in the entire area. Carnegie Library still has those books and they're actually in some special refrigeration room so they don't get ruined. The library is beautiful. It's one of my favorite places at Temple. This is the lockout lo Lockhart Lounge outside of the library. And if you see inside the fireplace, you can't see it on the slide, but inside the fireplace is where that coat of arms is that I took a picture of. And it, that, that outer view, you can, these three windows are where those three, the slides that I showed you that had the dragon and the coat of arms. This is just more beautiful stained glass that I have all the definitions and meaning of all of them, but I, I thought I had it with my paperwork, but I don't, so I'm happy to look into that for you. This I think I thought was so neat. Um, this Hanukkah, or menorah right here, sits next to the entryway to go into the chapel, and I found a, um, a little newspaper clipping of the, of the President Buckman, Leon Falk, Eisendrath, and Rabbi Levinson lighting that very same menorah um, that we have in our lobby, well, in that vestibule. And these are our beautiful gardens, which is a whole nother lecture I could give. <laughs> the gardens were based on an English, um, it was designed by an English designer and was based on a castle in England. These were taken just this past week. They're beautiful. Beautiful place to sit and relax. And again, you can see there's, there's all these quirky little things that 
were part of um, Worthington's family history. And there are the tridents and sables once again. This could have never happened without the help of Elaine Mormer and my very patient husband, Chris Pinkston, who lets me get all of my work done when I need to. And yells at me when I stay up too late. <laughs> and that, my friends, is the, the formation of Temple Simon. <laughs> Yes, sir. Um, when was the new addition built on to Temple Sinai? The first new addition was built in 1957. In 1954, there was a big ceremony for the burning of the mortgage because they were able to pay off the mortgage in just that short time from 47 to 54. And then they started a campaign to build on. So the first edition was put on in 57, and then the sanctuary was put on in 68. What's the difference between a temple and a synagogue? Uh, Reformed Jews usually refer to a synagogue as a temple. But conservative or orthodox Jews will refer to it as a synagogue, not a temple. So the next question will be... Uh, no, when we had Beth Shalom speak to us, I was roundly criticized by the rabbi for trying to use the word temple in relating to a conservative synagogue. Well, then that's the next question. Um, the difference between conservative and reformed, just basically. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, it's, I know, right? um, it, it's like in every religion, you have denominations. You have people who are more strict and people who are more liberal. And conservative is really kind of in the middle of orthodox and reform and they kind of take from both and do what they feel that they need to do to follow the letter of the law. They're not going to follow the 613 laws because they're not orthodox and they're not going to do other things that reform Jews might do. But, and they kind of like pick how they want to, their charter that they feel is works for them. A lot of conservative Jews walk to synagogue, um, but a lot of conservative Jews drive to synagogue. So it's really, you know, it's kind of the combination of Orthodox and Reform together. And they have they have their own mission and vision and values the same way every temple has their own as, mission and vision. As an organized group, are the conser in the U.S. are the conservatives older than the Reform? But they have no. their institutions no. before no. or after. They're not. It was the Orthodox and the Reform. But they, just like Reform Judaism has a union for Reform Judaism, there is a um, parent body for the um, conservative Jews and for the Orthodox Jews. Excuse me. I think the best thing to show the differentiation is the keeping of the code. I thought the same thing too, <laughs> but it's, I have conservative friends who daven at a conservative shul who eat meat and cheese. That's why we're in trouble. So, <laughs> but now at Temple Sinai, we don't, we don't, we know no more. A lot of Reformed Jews keep kosher. At Temple Sinai, we don't, we no longer have meat and cheese together. And we only have. How long did that take? I've been, in, I'm moving into my fifth year, so. Well, moving into our fifth year. <laughs> it is, it is, but I think it's important that everyone feel included. And if you are a Reformed Jew who chooses to, you know, you know, you want to be able to eat there still. If you read the 1886 Pittsburgh platform that basically made uh, Reformed Judaism, uh, you'd be shocked. We're so different. From you would that. be shocked. <laughs> of course. Yeah. But they have, but they have the revision of that. Oh, oh, there have been many revisions. Oh. But the official, but, like, but the 1886. Were they you flaming would be liberals? Pardon? Were they flaming liberals in 1886? It isn't a question of flaming liberal. It's, it's different. It, it's, what do you believe? Um, you know, essentially. More assimilation. More assimilation. 
what, right. what, what to be society. right assimilation was important but I mean basically uh, we don't believe in miracles you know, for example and, and it's, it was not you know, very mean, spiritual it's shocking you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to look at it yeah um, so, the since Toby brought that up uh, the Pittsburgh platform was Pittsburgh and Cincinnati mm -hmm. and the Jews in Cincinnati who I think sort of brought the platform up here or reached out to a shalom were living on the frontier. Cincinnati was a frontier city and No, they it really wasn't. It was an old city. Old they perceived city. it was perceived in no. in their mind. In any rate, they constantly were asking the question in a German, non Jewish city, how do we fit in? Hmm. That was always a big issue with them. They you had know. um they had Sunday school on uh, or they had services on Sundays to assimilate, to fit in. And even now, they don't wear kippot or talit on the bima at Rosh Hashanah. Standing with that. But they do at they do at Sinai. They do at Sinai. Rabbi Bisner does not wear a talit or a... Rabbi Jacobs does? Well, Rabbi Jacobs may, but I had a conversation with him about that, and he said for 40 years he never wore. I was there the night he put it on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think my point exactly. Just, that he just did the, the service when he was, was uh, when he was uh, sitting shiva for his wife, Pardon and he had me? nothing on. Um, concerning temple and yeah. synagogue. Uh, the reason that conservative and orthodox will not call a synagogue a temple is because one. the temple is where you did sacrifices years ago. Now what the history is and why reform are willing to call places of worship temple, I don't know. Uh -huh. But I know that's why orthodox and conservative get very offended if you call their place of worship a temple. Mm -hmm. But I don't know what the history is why the reform has been willing to. With the fire laws now, you just can't do it going <laughs> offering, you know. Part of the fire laws. <laughs> we don't want all that smoke. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, okay, we had to have a person buy the mansion because of the sea thing. What made them think they could convert it after and still be within the law? You know what? I'm not really sure. There's nothing I could find. That um, that lend itself to that, and I went all the way to like the building commissions. But here's the issue: you can't trace it back because anything built before 1915, no record, nothing. Mm -hmm. So I, I could not find that, and I poured over the notes in trying to um, figure that out. And I don't know if they all of a sudden I'm the individual owner, and now I can do with what I want because there was a swimming pool in the basement. And there was, in the notes, it talked about <clears throat> how um, the, it, the, how it was an eight feet swimming pool all the way around. Had it been a gradient swimming pool, they would have left it. But they were worried with it being eight feet only that the children would get hurt. So they turned it, they filled it up and they put wood over it and they turned it into the social hall. So I don't know how they got around it. I don't know if they actually did get around it. You, you said something about the, the, the stained glass and the pretty carvings and things. There was something in the sale saying that you shouldn't mess or mess Yes, mess there was something in the sale pending. And I, I looked at the original mortgage, which we, um, which we have at Temple. And it said something that they could not, um, within the sales agreement, they, there were certain things that they could not alter. Mm. But that would have been a private agreement because there were no public laws at that time right. doing that. Just honorable. Yeah. Jackie, uh, at, at age seven, I was in the first uh, religious school class, Temple Sinai. Oh, wow. We were here and at Asbury. Oh, that's awesome. At Asbury Methodist. Uh, but when we moved to the mansion, uh, we had at the, all the sinks had solid gold, I, I don't know what uh, well, what was done that. with it, solid gold fish with their mouths open <laughs> <laughs> for the faucets. I, I know they aren't there anymore. I heard they? about that. I read something about that, that every, every bathroom, because there was 30 rooms in the mansion. You saw these fish? Yes, yes. Oh, That's so cool. <laughs> That's how we 
paid off the mortgage. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, very, very well paid. I don't think gold was worth yeah. that much in those Maybe days. Maybe so. thirty-five dollars. Right. It's a, it's a, it's such a beautiful place. Are you still looking for people to talk to? For about the mansion? Oh yeah, for sure. I love it. Did you ever talk to Sandy Baskin? I I have her. Um, I have an interview with Nat Diamondstein, and I have her transcript of an interview Sandy, with Sandy Baskin. Sandy Baskin was the son of one of the original people. Right. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of original people, there was a woman named Nat Diamondstein. Stone. 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 Uh, she spoke to us uh, for a few years before she passed away. Was she in that original group? You were yes. yes. And if we had more time, I brought a, a DVD of an interview with, um, with her that talks about those first 25 founding families, because she was one of those founding families. And about it, she was saying, it was so exciting because it was me and all my friends, and we all had little kids, and we were so excited to start this new thing. And I think, like, for myself, my community and my, you know, like the friends that we have, and we all have little kids, and how how awesome that would be to like start this new congregation that you can really lay these strong foundations of family values, and that's what they did. And it's the interview is really, really, really good. So if at another time, or if any of you are interested, I'm happy to loan you the disc, and you can look at it yourself and. Jackie, you may be interested in this. When Nat came to speak to us, she talked about her dad. Yeah. And her dad had, had founded the uh, Board of Trade for Squirrel Hill mm -hmm. back when he was an early merchant. And because of that, he helped found, not because he was conservative, Beth Shalom. Because oh, neat. The, the merchants in downtown were asked what they wanted, and they wanted a conservative, they wanted a local conservative, conservative temple. Sure. So even though he never was a member there, he got it started with them. Then went to Road of Shalom oh. and then and they ended up at Sinai. We got a lot of organizational management. That's it's it's a lot to start a new organization. Any other questions? Uh, well, wait, do you have a list of the names of the uh, I do. founding families? Could could you read those off? I can. Please? Yeah, right here. I have so much research, it's unbelievable. You know, you just started the uh, Sinai archives. You aware of that? Uh, yes, I, I know those archives. So, the charter members were Sanford Baskin, Esther Landau, Sally Raphael, Jeanette Gelman, Morton Landau, Frida Baskin, I.R. Raphael, Martha, Martha Oranger, Ruth Hirsch, M.A. Baskin, Bernice Rubin, Velma Esman, Ben Rubin, Florence Lebov, Lebov, Lebov? Lebov. Okay. Bernard Abels, Edwin Goodman, Paul Chernow, Chernow Jeanette, Janet Abels, Mike Lebov, Eleanor Goodman, Ruth Chernow, Henry Cohen, Pearl Herrer, Jules Diamondstone, Esther Goodman, Nathan Holstein, Ann Cohen, Dorothy Wolken, Margaret Reich, Sam Herrer, Nat Diamondstone, Lot Marcus, Lillian Holstein, Norman Walken, and Burden L. Hirsch. Not shown in this is also Leon Falk Jr., Sarah Goldberg, Nathan and Pearl Gross, Nathan and Hilda Katzen, <coughs> Edgar and Leona, Linder, I'm sorry, Lindner, Oliver and Minnie Littman, Lillian Lockhart, Pauline Martin, and Arthur Moser. So they're all names that we've heard, and they're all, if you think about Temple Sinai, the Lockhart Lounge, and the Liebov Sanctuary, and I mean, this was their, their baby, and that's the first thing she says in the interview was, when she talks about Temple Sinai, it's like talking about her child. This was her baby. They had diamonds, though. The, the marvel I found in her was when we would have meetings and, she, and we wanted to change things, and she would try to persuade us, but this is how it always was done. And then we would overrule her, and then she'd say, but here is money to support that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she just moved forward all the time, and 
I only knew her as an elderly woman. And she just amazed me. Yeah. She just amazed she me. She sounded like a really neat lady. She, she was. was. She really was. Did you have a question? Um, I just wanted to ask if it's possible to visit the temple if you're not. Oh, in absolutely. The What's a good time to do that? Um, I'll give you my email and just email me and we'll set up a time. So, my contact information isn't on the slides, but. It's very easy. I'm all over the website. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. One of the things that we've been very lucky about with most of our speakers over the last decade is the, the amount of original material that is put together. You, we've, we've had talks about Sinai before, but you have heard a great deal of material that's never seen the light of day before, and you do have to start an archive. Thank you very much.